Anyways, good morning. Um, if you would make your way, we are, if you are unfamiliar with Calvary Chapel, if this is uh, one of your first times with us, uh, welcome, first of all. And then um, second of all, uh, you may be exposed to some some different teaching a different teaching style. Um, as cha- Calvary chapels go, the model is to teach in what is called an expositional style. So, like Joe said or alluded to, it is a verse by verse style. So, if you are like, man, well, where are you at? We're in the Book of Revelation. We just started, so welcome. We're only this is only our second weekend, and this will serve as a good introduction for you. So you're right at the beginning. You don't even have to catch up at all. So, um, with that being said, I'm going to pray for us, and then we will um, jump into our study. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, and um, I just thank you for just how. Um, kind of along the lines of what what April was praying this morning, and and just that you call us to obedience. And and, um, and, in James, it tells us that um, it it doesn't do us any good just to hear your word, but we actually have to do it. And so I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth this morning, your Holy Spirit would take what is preached, um, not by me, but from your scripture, and, and use it in a way to motivate motivate us to do for your kingdom and to work for your kingdom and um, that we can just go from this building to be the body of Christ to Laramie and minister um, wherever it is that you have us. Thank you for your word in Jesus name. Amen. Well, um, just to, just to give you a brief summary of the introduction that we did last week, um, this book of Revelation, it, it is a revelation that God the Father, we started out and examined these first three verses, and in it we have kind of the structure of who is giving the revelation and by what um, method has it come. And we see that God the Father has given it to Jesus, his son, to share with his followers by way of an angelic messenger to his servant John, who then is tasked with writing and recording all that we see in the book. Revelation as a letter contains insight into things to come, and the purpose behind it is to encourage the churches specifically mentioned at the outset of this introduction that they might be able to stand strong and remain faithful in the midst of trials. And no doubt the letter still holds its excuse me, its purpose even for us today. Charles Spurgeon observes, the aim of the book of Revelation is not to lead us into speculation, but is meant for practical purposes. Things written concerning the future are not intended so much to gratify our curiosity as to stimulate our watchfulness. The main objective is to keep us constantly on the lookout. And I would be amiss if I neglected to mention who we are to be looking out for, and that is Jesus. To borrow from last week, one of the best quotes from last week, in my opinion, from David Gusick, if we catch everything else but miss Jesus in the book, we miss the book of Revelation. And so from the outset here, we see that that's the purpose. And this morning specifically, it doesn't take long before we see that Jesus is going to take center stage and um, be the prime the primary focus of the writing. So to begin, we'll be picking up, actually we'll just read from from verse 1 through verse 8 is what we're covering this morning. So to begin, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And just a short word on amen, because apparently in our modern culture, it's been lost what the actual definition of amen is. Um, Some in our 
in public office think that it's like a gendered thing, that if you're declaring a man, you have to declare a woman too. Um, that's not correct. That is the incorrect interpretation. A man simply is an, a, a, an utterance of like agreeance, or uh, it could be translated, so be it. Let it be so. Is, is this what this idea of amen carries with it? So as you're praying and you close with amen, it's not so much just, I, I know as Christians, it's the, you know, it's the period of our prayers. It's how it goes. But as you're praying, consider what you're praying because then at the end, you're asking God to let it be so. And we see this word take place Two times as John is writing this introduction here, he's basically saying, you know, let Jesus have dominion and power and glory. Yeah, let that be so. And then verse 7, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen, let it be so. And then to close, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Um, just to give you the outline for this morning and the title of, of, of our sermon, it's Greetings from Heaven. As we see this short section, it's basically God giving kind of this introductory benediction, if you will. And I broke it down, just three points and a conclusion. Number one, Paul or John, man, how many times am I going to do that? I did that last week too. It's probably because Paul's my favorite writer. But anyways, John, writing on behalf of, that's the first two verses, verses four and five. He's writing on behalf of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. And then we see a list of accolades in the second part of verse five through verse six. We see this list of accolades particularly pertaining to Jesus. Jesus' titles, Jesus' love, Jesus' work, and Jesus' honor. And then to close, we'll be looking at this short declaration in verses seven and eight. Um, behold, I am coming quickly, and then this declaration of I am. As John begins to pin this letter to these seven churches in Asia, it is very interesting to notice the structure of the introduction, because almost immediately, John fades into the background. He is not the focus or what we should be drawing our attention to, and he is sure to place the proper focus solely on God. God is the object, God is the focus of this letter, not John. John is not the source of this letter. Rather, he greets these seven churches as a representative, a representative of God the Father. This isn't John writing the letter, this is John writing on behalf of God the Father. And as we later find out, he, John is going to be receiving these visions from heaven, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he receives, he writes. A lot of, um, a lot of Paul's letters are written in this way, where Paul would be kind of giving the, the oral, he would be giving the letter through oral interpretation, and he would have like either Silas or maybe Timothy sitting, writing down what was happening. And so if you want to picture in that way, God is giving the oral um, declaration, and John is just simply writing it down. All right, what's, what's next, God? Okay, God, got it. Okay, next. And, and that's how it goes. To begin the introduction, we have this benediction or announcement of a blessing given at the outset. It tells us, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. We have this declaration of grace and peace. It's interesting because grace is the Greek charis and peace is the Hebrew shalom. Grace means favor and blessing from God. It's also unmerited favor. In other words, we haven't earned it. God gives grace freely, we learn in Ephesians 2.8. A.W. Tozer defines grace in this way. He says, grace 
is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. It is a self-existent principle inherent in the divine nature and appears to us as a self-caused propensity to pity the wretched, spare the guilty, welcome the outcast, and bring into favor those who were before under just disapprobation. Its use to us, sinful men, is to save us and make us sit together in heavenly places to demonstrate to the ages the exceeding riches of God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So grace is not something that somehow or another we've convinced God that we're worthy of, or somehow or another we motivate him to extend grace to us. No. Grace is God's unmerited favor towards an undeserving people. God's riches at Christ's expense. I don't know if you've ever heard grace defined that way. And not only is grace extended to us from the Father, but peace is included as well. And not a peace like serenity or like a Zen state, but peace with God. No longer at odds with Him, but reconciled to Him. Another thing to notice is the relationship between grace and peace that is also present and revealed to us in the order in which they are given. Grace always precedes peace. If you read through, a lot of times Paul introduces his, his um, letters this way and he'll often close his letters in this way. Grace and peace to you. Grace always precedes peace. God's grace is given to us and it is by his grace that we have access into his peace. You can only have access to the peace of God through the grace of God. All roads to peace lead through grace, as it were. Grace and peace may seem strange to mention at the beginning of this letter, but it is these attributes that God wants to grow within us as the contents of this letter are revealed. Then, as its contents contents are illuminated to us, grace and peace are multiplied unto us as we read his divine revelation. The more we read, the more that's revealed, the more you know about the end, the more grace, the more peace you will have in your life. Something to be aware of is that grace and peace are not just readily available resources. You can't just willy-nilly go outside, pick up a handful off the street. You can't just find them lying anywhere on the ground. Grace and peace are exclusively sourced from God the Father. He is the originator of these attributes. And we see that it is from his hand that they are declared and that they are extended to us in this greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. If you, I was thinking of it in terms of, of uh cultural reference, if you wanted, just to give you a little illustration. The Father is what makes grace and peace possible. If you want, if you've ever seen the movie Back to the Future, and Marty and Doc Brown are talking about what makes time travel possible, it's the flux capacitor, right? It's what makes time travel possible. Possible, And so what makes grace and peace possible? It's God. He's the flux capacitor of grace and peace. Okay? God and his eternal characteristics are what make grace and peace possible. Because grace is always extended by a higher power. Something greater towards something lesser. God is the ultimate in the universe. And so grace is going to be sourced from him and him alone. The only way you can extend grace to someone is if you are in a higher position than them. What makes the ingredients for peace? I just came up with a short list. Knowledge, security, maybe throw comfort in there. I don't know if that's necessary for peace, but I would say knowledge and security are essential components of peace. The more you know, the better you're going to feel about it. And so, in looking at it, at it in that context, grace and peace are extended to us from God in this letter because the more you know, the more at peace you'll be able to, 
you'll, you'll be able to rest in that peace. And so God is giving us this revelation of the end to grant us grace and peace. God's status as the eternal being of the universe gives him every capacity to fulfill every requirement for our grace and peace. He is higher than us, therefore in the position to offer grace. He is outside of time, therefore in the position to offer peace. So on the outset, we see God the Father digging deep into his supernatural makeup and divine nature in order to extend to us gifts of grace and peace. But it's not the Father only that we see representing this letter at the outset. It's, we also see the Holy Spirit present, and then we also see Jesus Christ the Son present. So grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's from the Father and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. It may be confusing to read the description of the Holy Spirit here, so maybe this will help. Don't think of uh, the seven spirits as like seven separate spirits, but in context of the idea that seven represents completeness. And so, or maybe even better, read the sevenfold spirit of um, that, that's before the throne. It's a description of the complete nature of the Holy Spirit. Maybe think of it as a seven-layer dip you have at, at a party that all of the seven layers make up one complete unit and it tastes so good, right? That's the Holy Spirit. Matthew Henry writes, The Holy Spirit called the seven spirits, not seven in number nor in nature, but the infinite perfect spirit of God in whom there is a diversity of gifts and operations. He is before the throne, for as God made, so he governs all things by his spirit. This idea of the sevenfold spirit actually quotes from Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, we see in Isaiah 11, 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's in Isaiah 11, verse 2. And David Gusick writes, It isn't that there are seven spirits of God. Rather, the Spirit of the Lord has these characteristics, and he has them all in fullness and perfection. And so, since he has those characteristics, he is able to extend to us those same characteristics through his work and through his knowledge. Next, we see the Son, Jesus, as the, the third person of the Trinity. And in verse 5, we see, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And as we see Jesus introduced, he gets the majority of the, of the space that's dedicated here in this introduction. And we see this list of accolades given to him. Jesus' titles, Jesus' love, Jesus' work, and Jesus' honor. The first is Jesus' titles. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So first, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, and his word can be trusted. He has brought to us the message from heaven, the message of the Father, and has not failed in its delivery. In John 1.18, we read, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness of the Father. He is trustworthy. He's reliable. And those are two things that are essential components in a witness. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be reliable. If their witness is neither of those two things, then they're not a good witness. And so we see Jesus is both trustworthy and reliable. And then in John 14... We see another reference where Jesus is declaring the way to the Father and bearing witness of him. Thomas said to him, John 14, 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus has revealed can be trusted. It's in his very nature. 
He is the trustworthy witness. His next descriptor is that he is the firstborn from the dead. This not only speaks of the fact that he is the first to rise from the dead, never to die again, but it also speaks of his position. The expression firstborn can also be a placeholder for rank. Jesus is supreme or the preeminent in the resurrection. And all those who seek to overcome death themselves must be conformed to his model. Jesus is the example of what the resurrection of the dead looks like. David Gusick writes, it also means that he is preeminent among those who are or will be resurrected. And Gino Geraci adds, every single person who rises from the dead do so because Jesus rose from the dead. And Romans 8.29 adds, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. If you want to picture Jesus as the prototype, if you will, of the resurrection. He's the first one to roll off the assembly line. He's the one that God put all of the R&D into. He's the one that God releases first. Jesus is the preeminent. He's the one that goes before all, the firstborn among the dead. So Jesus is the first, the faithful witness, the preeminent even overseer over the resurrection, and lastly, he is, de he is described as the ruler over the kings of the earth. Because of Jesus' faithful dedication and obedience to the Father, he has now been given authority, dominion, and power as the supreme ruler over all things. Paul summarizes this idea in Philippians chapter 2. I'll just give you the summary. In Philippians chapter 2, he's encouraging those in the church to follow in Christ's model. And what Jesus modeled is this model of humility that then leads to exaltation. Jesus is exalted because he was willing to first be humbled. And so that's kind of then Paul uses that as the model, that we should be like Christ, that we should follow in his footsteps in that way. If we want to be exalted, we need to first humble ourselves. His authority hasn't come into its full fruition as of yet. He is the ruler over the heavenly kingdom. But one day, and over the course of our study, we will discover that all things are going to be brought under his control, and he will be declared King of Kings and Lord of Lords over, over all, over everything in Revelation 19. But coming back to the verses before us, the description of Jesus continues describing his great love for us. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So there's a couple things I want to point out here really, really, really quick. So as you read it, you read that the loved, this verb is in the past tense, it can also be, so, so there's some controversy about whether or not it's actually translated correctly. I think you can take it both ways, and I'll, and I'll explain my reasoning here. First, you can take it as past tense because the supreme example of love that is given to us through Christ Jesus is given to us in the event of the cross. And so that is a past tense event that carries with it present tense benefits, okay? And so there is always this going to be this past tense link and this supreme link to the love of God in Christ Jesus. How do you know that Jesus loves you? He gave his life for you on the cross, okay? So Jesus has loved you, but he also loves us in the, in the, in the present tense. There's one supreme moment where his love is demonstrated towards us in the cross, and yet his love continues. It goes on. It's in the present always. He loves us today, tomorrow, 
and on into the future. But the supreme example, Jesus tells us in John 15, 13, that greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And if that's the case, Jesus later talks about, you know, you know, for, for righteous man, anyone would surely die. But it, ta- it, it takes God, it takes deity to die for sinners. David Gusick writes, Every believer should be secure in God's love, not based on their present circumstances, which may be difficult, but based on the ultimate demonstration of love at the cross. The work of Jesus on the cross for us is God's ultimate proof of his love for you. He may give additional proof, but he can give no greater proof. I just want that to sink in for a minute because that's, that's this, it's a mind blowing reality. If you think about it, especially in our culture where the, where there's a great attitude of, um, just entitlement. And so that can seep into, to our Christian life where we feel like we're entitled to God's love. And that's not the case. God has demonstrated for you in his, his love in this, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's it. That's the ultimate. If, if, if you have no other expression of God's love poured out into your life, that's all you need. Okay? Roger, you're good. However, God in his grace extends to us more love. He has lavished his love on us. It, I, I would picture it in this way. So, so giving your kid a bath, our kids get baths, and then immediately after they get out of the bath, they get lotioned up, right? I, don't, I personally don't believe in lotion. My wife does, and so we lotion our kids, okay? Okay. So if you want to think of it in that way, like you get out, the requirement is to get lotioned. That's what God does for, for you on the outset. What God has done then is to take, pick you up and dunk you in a huge barrel of lotion and lavish it on you, right? Until you don't even see skin. All you see is layers of lavished lotion, lavished God's love on you, okay? The base is just, yeah, let's get some lotion on you. The lavishment, dunk it in the lotion, okay? So we see... And, and so then, so God's love, it's been declared to us, it's been demonstrated to us by the death of Christ. And now we see Jesus' work. What has Jesus' love done? He has accomplished on our behalf the work of salvation, the work of redemption, and reconciliation to the Father. So we see by Jesus' work, we now have access to an elevated status. And I don't want you to read verse 6 and think too highly of yourself, okay? Don't get that idea, like, oh, yeah, I'm a king, I'm a pre... Like, yes, you are those things, but you did not gain access to those things simply by just being you, okay? Jesus had to accomplish a great work on my behalf in order to elevate me to that status. Because at the outset... I'm an enemy. We are enemies of God. Okay? And so a great work has to be done to transform my identity from being an enemy of God to now adopted as a child of God. And it says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see by Jesus' work, we now have access to an elevated status, never before available to us. He has brought us out of bondage and given us new identities. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 adds to this idea, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Jesus has elevated us. It's nothing we could do of our own accord. And therefore he deserves, and this is so cool how God gives this to John because our elevated status, it doesn't then give us bragging rights. It gives us then 
gifts to give back to Jesus. He deserves all honor and glory because he has elevated us. It's not for our own doing, it's for his glory. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He deserves all the credit, all the honor, all the glory, and he will get it. Then, after we see this list of accolades given to Jesus, there's a declaration made about him. We're wrapping this up. It says in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In this declaration, we see Jesus is coming back, and all will see him. Not to give away the end, but we see this event take place in Revelation 19. If you want to read about it, it's incredible. We see Jesus coming on a white horse in the clouds. All of the saints are following close behind him. That's you and I, if you're if you're in the fold here. And so we are coming with Jesus. And it's actually not this glorious scene. It's actually this great battle scene that's taking place. And as Jesus comes down from heaven... A sword comes out of his mouth and he lays waste to all of his enemies by just a whisper. It's incredible. And so we see him coming with clouds and it will take place. This event has been prophesied a few other places in scripture, specifically Zechariah 12.10. It reads, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. As I was studying, it was made clear. I think it was David Guzik that made the... Um, observation that John, as he's writing this, didn't necessarily have to receive divine revelation from God that this event would take place. All he had to do was just reference the scriptures that he already had access to. He went back, read Zechariah, or recalled it from memory. He goes back and reads Daniel chapter 7, where it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And then John could even reference um, Jesus' own words that he would have taught them in his earthly ministry. Jesus himself gives testimony of this very event before the high priest during his trial. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's Matthew twenty six sixty four. And then, to cap it all off, the angels at Jesus' ascension, as Jesus is drawn up into heaven and the disciples are just chilling there. They're like, all right, is he going to come back? Are we, what are we doing? And so then Jesus is like up in heaven and he sees his boys. They're not going to Jerusalem. They're not spreading the gospel like he gave them instruction to do. So he sends the angels down to tell them, hey, it's time to get on your horse and go and go and do this thing, okay? This thing called ministry. We're going to spread the gospel, okay? And so the angels come, Acts 1, 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. I picture all of them looking up to heaven, and then the angels just like appearing beside them. And they're like looking at him and looking up and looking at him and looking up. They're like... What are you guys? What are you guys looking at? And and then they say to them, "Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven." 
Gino Geraci summarizes all of this. Jesus Christ is coming back. His coming will be universal, known by all, historical, visible, physical. At his coming, God will judge the nations. The unbelieving kingdoms of man will crumble. A remnant will be saved, and God's enemies will be crushed. And the declaration of this reality would then I don't know, be the source that, that would fill the recipients of this letter with hope, that their momentary affliction could be endured, that they can overcome, that they will overcome, that Jesus will overcome. And it's a timeless message. It's useful and valid for all generations of the church. For if Christ is victorious, all who are his will be victorious with him. Then to close his introduction, we see the declaration of Jesus himself. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. All things have their origination in Christ, and all things will be brought to fruition in Christ. To begin his gospel, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. A crazy observa observation from Chuck Missler about the, the original letter and this Greek and how it was written. So... <sighs> The Alpha and the Omega are the beginning and ending letters of the Greek alphabet. It would be like saying, Jesus is the A to Z, okay? He's everything. And so in, in the, the original Greek, the Alpha is written out, the full word. And, the, and this is crazy. So, so the Alpha, it's fully written out, signifying that creation has been completed. However, on the other hand, the omega is just present in the letter. The full word is not written out, signifying that the end is yet to be fulfilled. <laughs> Holy smokes, right? And so we see, like, and he was sure to point out that, that Jesus said, you know, not a jot or tittle will pass away from, from, from my word or from this prophecy until it's fulfilled. And so we see that even in like the absence, even in just like the, the one letter being present, God has sent forth his word in such a full and complete way that, man, you could study this thing. So you study this thing in English for the rest of your life. Add into that. All right, start studying it in Hebrew. Start studying it in the Greek. And all of a sudden, you have an eternity's worth of content that you can dedicate your life to in studying God's Word. David Gusick writes, Some wonder if it is God the Father or God the Son speaking here. We suspect it is the Son, Jesus Christ, and we believe this for many reasons. First, since it is Jesus' revelation, it seems appropriate that he introduced it. Second, the titles Alpha and Omega and the beginning and the end are titles claimed by Jesus in Revelation 22, 13. Third, the title who is and who was and who is to come is used of God the Father in verse 4. It is also true of God the Son and seems to be directed to Jesus in Revelation eleven seventeen and sixteen five. Jesus' deity is on full display here as he and the Father share the same title. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not bound or changed by time, and his eternal and unchanging nature gives us hope and it gives us comfort because we can be confident in the promises he has given simply based on his nature. He's unchanging. And so a promise that he has given in the past is still good in the, in the here and now and on into the future. Jesus also is the Almighty. And the Greek word Almighty is Pantocrator. The word means the all-controller, the all-ruler. He's the one who possesses all power. He is omnipotent, able to do anything. He controls everything, the universe and every being within the universe. This means if a person belongs to Jesus, they belong to him for eternity. And I think that 
Jesus kind of aptly describes this idea in John chapter 10 where he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The title given to Jesus here at the end of this greeting It signifies his ability to carry out the divine work yet to be done. He was present before the beginning of all things. He will be present beyond the end of all things. And to close our time this morning, I just wanted to give you a summary, a closing thought from David Guzik. He writes, if Jesus is both the beginning and the end, then he also has authority over everything in between. This means that Jesus has a plan for history. And he directs the path of human events toward his designed fulfillment. And that should give you a lot of peace in the current state of our culture. Because it may seem that, man, the world just seems like it's out of control. That maybe it got knocked off its axis or something. Like everything's just going haywire. And yet... Considering that Jesus is overall and in, in, in all, like above all, all of it, he's still in control. And everything, no matter how bad it seems to be getting, no matter how bad it gets, Jesus is in control and he's exercising authority over history. Our lives, David Guzik continues, are not given over to blind fate, to random meaninglessness, or to endless cycles with no resolution. Instead, Jesus Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, directs all of human history and even our individual lives. And with that, I say, even so, amen. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this introduction that gives us a a feel for what to expect in this divine letter. I pray, Lord, that as our study continues, we would not lose sight of you, but that you would be firmly fixed in our gaze. That as we set our eyes on you, Jesus, you would become for us what it says you are, the author, the perfecter of our faith. So, Lord, continue to write your history through our lives. May we continue to be faithful witnesses and faithful servants for your kingdom and for your glory. Thank you for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?